Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love and your guidance. We pray for your strength. We pray for your work in our lives. Father God, I pray for the students now as life is so busy. I ask that you would give them guidance and strength to accomplish what they need to get done. They can budget their, their, their time. I pray that you would bless and strengthen them, that they would be able to do all those things that are necessary, Father. The evil, the evil one wants to, to stop us and to um, discourage us, Father. I pray that your spirit would encourage us, that the peace that passes all understanding would be with us. Father, we pray for this COVID crisis to be brought to an end, um, and I pray that you would spare life. Father God, as we study your word and we study your law, may we have understanding. Father, we want to exalt your, your law. We don't want to take it lightly. We want to follow the example instructions that your son gave to us. May we not be like the Pharisees who thought little of the weightier matters, that we would care about those, those weightier matters. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Let's get into the text. Tonight is probably going to be worth the weight in gold because we had questions about the law and we have a lot of text to look at. I think that we'll, it'll be very clear. We might go over time tonight, but I'm just, we're gonna go through this. I hope that we see this clearly. We have some strong passages that really bring it to light. And I think all of us, when we get away from the, come away from this class, we should be on the same page. I really believe that with all my heart. And I think that the only thing that will prevent us from getting there is perhaps our, our pride and our sometimes our stubbornness. I'm not saying that because my interpretation is right. I'm saying it because I think that the word of God will really be revealed and it will be uh, clear. So just a quick review of our partners and those that are making this happen. We wanna thank uh, Cebu Graduate School of Theology, uh, EVST, and also Converge. And we are on to session number 14. So next week will be our last session. We are behind, but these things are so deep. And in many ways, Voss kind of just assumes you're very knowledgeable. And there are some deficiencies with Voss's book, but I hope that tonight you'll see, uh, you'll see clearly. So we're on to part four, revelation, special revelation during the Mosaic era. So just a quick... Uh, Overview of the session, we will briefly review the calendar. We will briefly review the assignments. I'll probably do that at the end of the class, not, not now, because the, the content's more important. We are gonna be spending all of our time in the scripture. So we are praying that the internet will maintain, will hold firm, that we can really have just this, this time to study. And we will, we're gonna go text by text and we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see these relationships here. And then we'll have a conclusion in prayer. So that's the goal. So just a, a quick review for uh, CGST, EVST calendar. So we're on different schedules. I don't think anyone's graduating as it, it can't, turned out, no one's graduating. So for CGST students, May 7th, which would be this week, but there's no one graduating, so we're okay. May 14th is the last week that we will meet. So I believe it's maybe May 10th we will meet. Um, all assignments are due by May 26th, especially for CGST. So some of you are in CGST, all your assignments need to be in. The, 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 the final also needs to be completed. And um, uh, EVST, I want us to have a goal of May 26th. If we need to push it back a little bit, we can, but we you need to make a priority to, to work on your assignments. Um, I'm really thinking about picking another night in the week where we come together. You could, I'm thinking about coming together as like a study hall. So you will, we will come together on Zoom, but we're not going to talk with each other. We're going to study because, you know, I think that sometimes life just gets so busy and then we just run out of time. So if we set aside a time where we're going to, to be together, pray, pray with each other really quick and then, and then work, I think that might be better. So be thinking about a time that we can start meeting in the week. It can't be Tuesday night because we have another class, but a time that all of us can come together. There'll be no lecture. We will just work on, on the assignments, um, especially those that struggle with finding the time. I think there'll be an incentive there for us to work if we're doing it together. Okay, so this is kind of a, <laughs> there's a typo there. So I'm just gonna bring this all out here. Okay, so tonight, 
We are looking at all of these passages. All of these passages, I'll take a moment for you to write this all down. These passages are fundamental for understanding the relationship of the New Testament with the Mosaic Law. Okay? These passages are absolutely fundamental. They are absolutely fundamental. So if you can write these down, you can see that there's a huge emphasis in Matthew. And I, and I, I want to be, Matthew, we're going to take most of our time. I think once we work through Matthew, the rest will just fall, fall into place. But Matthew is really clear. I think Matthew will be very clear for us. And so Matthew 5, 17 to 20, Jesus is directly answering the question of his relationship to the Mosaic law. And then 21 to 48, he actually is interpreting the Mosaic law. Okay. And then there's a, a conclusion in Matthew 7, 12. It's very malakas. It's very strong. And then we're going to look at Matthew 15 because the issue that, 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 that people don't understand often is that the Sermon on the Mount was not giving a new law, but bringing the Mosaic law to its fulfillment, to its completion, to its perfect form, uh, to its perfect interpretation. Matthew 15 is showing us that there is a, a misinterpretation with the Mosaic law by the Pharisees. We will also see that in Matthew 23, 1 to 39. And then Matthew 22 is dealing with our text from Mark. So we're just going to focus on Matthew, keeping the theme of, of Matthew. And then Matthew 28, actually 16 to 20, there's the law there. I think that when you see Matthew 28 in this context, it will, it will bring whole new meaning to the Great Commission. And it will bring whole new meaning to the Great Commission, I think. I think it will for you. Then we will look at Romans 2 and Luke 18. Looking at the law and gospel context. Looking at the law and gospel context. Then we will look at the law in the church context. So, of course, there's church and there's gospel. Of course, there's, there's gospel context in Matthew. But now we're looking at specific case studies. We'll look in Romans, James, and Ephesians concerning the law in the church. <laughs> okay. Um, and then lastly, we'll conclude with, again, looking at the relationship of the church and Israel in Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. I think Danny, Koya Bullboy, perhaps, Ray, we had the Ephesians 2, uh, 11 to 22, right? Diva and Sherwin's, his, his, his hostel, right? His hotel, remember that? We had that unpacking. That was two years ago. How crazy is that? Pastor Henry, you weren't there for that. We had, we were, we were in the back of his hostel, his hotel, and we were unpacking Ephesians 2 on the PowerPoint. It's crazy. How has the world changed? Now we're home in the comfort of Zoom. <laughs> we are worried about the air con. <laughs> it stacks. Oh, my goodness. It's crazy. Okay. All right. So this is, this is uh, we're setting the table. We're going to work at these texts. We might go late tonight. I will just be uh, long-winded. This is this is this is what the whole class. This is the climax of the class. Matthew chapter five. So we had different questions from different groups. Perhaps you forgot which group you were in, or perhaps you don't want to share which group you're in. That's fine. We're not going to be focusing on groups. It's not going to be who's right, who's wrong. I don't want it to be like that. What we will do rather is we'll just talk through this text. We'll have significance, we'll discuss context, and then and then we'll draw some conclusions at the end. Okay, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna go, we're gonna go text by text. So Matthew 5, 17 to 20. I'm gonna go ahead and read it here. Everyone can see it. The word of the Lord. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you. Until heaven and earth pass away, not one yota or dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does them and teaches them <laughs> will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, 
you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Very powerful passage of scripture here. Um, we, we have the questions, who is the, the speaker? Who is the audience? What is the content? And then is the law still is the law still binding? Is it abrogated? Is it fulfilled? The first thing I want to say, I want to show us is this. We, we've looked at this before, okay? But this is the action. So Jesus is explicitly saying he is not coming to abolish. Look at the object here. Jesus is not abolishing the law or the prophets. So any reference to being brought to an end, destroying could be another word, nullifying. Jesus is explicitly saying he's not doing that. Everyone tracking there with me? And then even stronger, we have a, a repeat, I am not coming to abolish, but to fulfill them. So the focus now is, is really upon this word fulfill. So Jesus is coming to fulfill. Now, we don't know yet at this statement, the question is, what does this word mean? So we can, we can see this word fulfill. Now, I'm just giving a range of meaning here, okay? Number one, it can mean like literally to fill, to fill or to complete. So if we talk about something being incomplete, Diba, a piece of paper is incomplete. It has three paragraphs. It's designed to have four paragraphs. You're filling it in to bring it to completion, Diba. So maybe your paper has an introduction, a content, um, and then there's a conclusion. It's missing the conclusion. You have to fill it in to complete it. A form is partially filled out, it needs to be filled in to be completed, okay? That's one sense in which this word can be used. Another sense that this word can be used in this idea of, of promise, in this sense, it's, it, there is something that is stated, there's a promise, there is there's a, 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 a statement of something in the future will happen, and then it is brought into reality, or we could say accomplished. Everyone tracking there with me? Everyone tracking? So again, this is the range of meaning for this word. And so it depends upon the context. Now in this context, what, my, what I'm going to argue is it's pregnant. It's pregnant, it actually contains all these meanings. Now people will say, Tim, that's, a, that's, that's wrong. That's not wrong. It, it, sometimes in a very deep theological context, a word that has multiple nuances can, can carry all of it because the word is, is full of meaning, okay? So most of the time, linguistically, when we're doing translation, when we're speaking, one word has one meaning, okay? But let's, let's give an example where a word can have two meanings. I'm just going to give a very basic, this is an English idiom. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you'll understand it. Maybe you won't for sure. You have it in Tagalog, but we have a saying, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make, someone fill it in. If it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense, right? So it's like, well, is it, is it sense as in like, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't logically work or is it sense as in, as in the money, right? So that word that's being used, it's a double entendre. It's full of this meaning, okay? It's, 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 it's a play on words. Everyone tracking there with me? So, so at times when we want, we can use a word that's full of meaning, right? So what I want us to say, I wanna, what, I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I wanna say here is that I'm gonna argue that there's multiple meanings that are implied here because the law has multiple perspectives of multiple purposes, okay? So to say only one fits, and that's why maybe I kind of set you up for failure, okay? Because I said, which one is it? And, and I, but I never said you could have multiple answers, okay? So fair enough, I never said that, okay? Number three, number three, this word fulfill can also mean do, okay? Do, 
So you'll, we're going to see later that this context is clearly in case. In this context, uh, again, this could be referring to Jesus. So Jesus is, uh, we'll see later in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is the obedient servant that goes to the cross. Okay, So he does, he's, he, he, he fulfills the law in the sense of doing it, being obedient. Everyone tracking? So what I want us to see here is that Jesus, he, he fills or completes the law. Okay, so he brings it to completion. So, so Jesus brings the law to completion, number one. That is its, its full meaning. Jesus also is going to ac accomplish certain promises. So Jesus is going to accomplish, um, uh, Jesus is bringing the law to full meaning. He's also going to ac uh, accomplish promises. Okay, so this is number two. So number one, Jesus brings it to full meaning. Number two, Jesus accomplishes promises. And then number three, Jesus is going to, to obey the law. Jesus is going to obey the law. And so one example here that we don't have time to go to, but I'm just going to refer you here, is that when Jesus, Jesus in, in Matthew 3, verse 15, when John says, I, I, I don't need to be baptized, you, I don't need to baptize you, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, no, let it be so, uh, let it be so, for it is thus fitting to fulfill all righteousness. <laughs> to fulfill all righteousness. So in that sense, he's doing it. So we could also talk about Jesus being the obedient servant. And actually here, the obedient son. This would be the servant of Isaiah. This would be the son of God. So it's in this sense that Jesus has come to fulfill the law. Okay, so I'm going to prove this to you, okay? We, we, can, we can look at this obedience sense. We don't have time to go there. But in Matthew, Matthew 3, 15, we have this obedient sense here, okay? So you can study that in your own time, all right? The follow-up question remains, well, what about is the law still binding? If Jesus accomplishes if Jesus accomplishes, why do we still need to obey it, correct? Um, so, so what we cannot look at here as being an or, or an or here. Is everyone tracking there with me? This is not an or, but a both and. Is everyone tracking there with me? It's not an either or, it's a both and, okay? And so, of course, Jesus accomplishes parts of the law. Jesus does parts of the law to fulfill it. But he also brings it to the full meaning. We just saw a context where Jesus does, Matthew 3, 15. Look here. Not one yoda or one dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So here is number two, promise, fulfillment. Not one yoda or dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Okay, so there it's, it's, there it's going into this sense of here. Everyone tracking there with me? We already have, we already have this doing part, okay? Now watch this though. Is there also a sense in which the law is being filled out or completed? If the law is being filled out or completed in the sense of being brought, this is, this is the full meaning, or we could also say uh, right interpretation. And it's in this sense that we refer to it still being binding. Everyone tracking there with me? Let's take a pause. I don't want to rush it. Ask a question, or if this is making sense, we can move on. I want to make sure that everyone's tracking there with me. Let's take a pause. Any questions? Anyone wants to, to, to add, add something? We're going to move first, then Ray. Go ahead. Go ahead. Could we, what? Uh, 
since uh, we are already we are dealing in that full meaning or the accomplishment, could we specify what is that law that Jesus is going to accomplish? Because admittedly, there are so many laws. Yeah. What is that law that is referring to that is accomplished? Yeah, yeah, no, okay, excellent. So, so excellent question, Cody Boy Boy. We are going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay. Now, for sure, when you talk about accomplished, we, we, we the word all. So I'm going to highlight this word all. So there's definitely this, this comprehensive nature of accomplishing, Cody Boy Boy. But if you're thinking about the specific Binding laws that are still applicable. Is that more your question? What laws are still applicable? Is, is that the question, Koya Boboy? Yeah. So we're gonna Koya Boboy's question is getting oops, Koya Boboy's question is getting to this this uh this area right here. And so we're going to that's where we're going to next. Okay, that's where we're going to next. So just so you're you're setting it up. Uh Koya Ray, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just had the same question with Koya Boboy. Which law is Jesus referring to? Yeah, okay, great. So we're getting there. Okay, so it's, so that's 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 the succeeding context down here. And then we're going to go to Matthew 521 to get into the examples. Okay, so great question. Okay, so so look at this. Uh, go ahead, Jesus. Uh, sir, okay. So since you mentioned about, sir, that uh, Jesus accomplished uh, the law already, or uh, it was go back to the idea of salvation. We know that Salvation is not, we're not, uh, well, we're not saved by law. So yeah. my question now is, what is the role of the law if it's been all accomplished? What's now the role of the law, uh, especially in, in the Israel, sir? Yeah, so so let's end, that question is related to this, the question that Koyo Bobo and Koyo Ray had. Let's look at how, so like for sure, Diba, Jesus says, I've not come I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Okay. So, so for sure, Jesus seems to be answering. So we want to, we, before we answer that question, um, Jesus, we want to ask, what does Jesus mean? So we've, we've highlighted, we've highlighted um, uh, here. And then we've also highlighted here. And so the, what is the role now, if Jesus is fulfilling and he's accomplishing, and he's also the obedient servant. What about how? How do we now relate, Diba? Because if he's going to fulfill, how do we relate? So let's let's let Jesus answer that question for for us, okay? Um, the law is still there, right? The law is still there. It's not abolished, right? Yeah. So, that, so what's we're, we're, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> let's let's no, but so so let's look at the text, and then we'll make some conclusions. So I think you're wanting to get to the conclusion. So look here. So look at this. Watch this. Therefore, <laughs> this is an inference here. So this is not a new topic. This is not a change in topic. What, what, this is the foundation for then what is to follow here. Everyone sees that? So if we were to make the conclusion that Jesus is only fulfilling, he's only the obedient servant, if Jesus is only accomplishing things, then, then um, that's it. And that's, that's where the text would go. Okay. He would say something like, don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. Right. Look at what he says here. Look at the next statement. Whoever relaxes the least of these commandments. So there's this action here of relaxing. So if we were only seeing it in a two dimensional meaning accomplishment, accomplishing events, and then uh, being the obedient one who fulfills this, that makes no sense. Whoever relaxes the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, right? Look at what they will be called. Look at the action. They will be called least in the kingdom. So if we're saying that Jesus has done it, we don't have to worry about the law anymore. That is not the therefore, <laughs> Everyone see that? Is everyone tracking there with me? <laughs> you you would think that everything's topless now. It's fine. But look, the command is look at the adversative here. Adversative. But so it's not this. Not this. Okay. 
but this. But whoever does them and teaches them, does and teaches them. What is the them? The them goes back to the commandments. The them goes back to these commandments. And this is coming back to the law. What are these commandments? So it means, team, it means that Jesus has entrusted to us to complete the law. Not to complete, to teach and to do. To He's completing. Do Jesus is completing. Jesus is filling out, okay? So um, now look at this. This is the hinge. Watch this. Look at this. Four. Four. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So righteousness, righteousness. Exceeds the Pharisees and the scribes, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is righteousness? Someone answer me. Uh, Kuya Boba, you are, you are the lawyer. What is righteousness? What does that pertain? Doing what the law says. Yes, this is in a state of conformity, uh, conformity to the law. So what he said is correct. I'm just giving the noun form. State of conformity to the law. So if, if we are obeying the laws of the Philippines, we can say we are righteous, law-abiding citizens. All right? So what Jesus is saying is that your righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes of the Pharisees. This is where Lutherans will say, uh, see, this is saying that we can never do the law. The statement is actually meaning to show to us that no one can do it, and it's to drive us to Christ, okay? That's what Lutherans will say, or someone that's very much against the law being able us to keep it, okay? Okay. The difficulty with that, again, is the statement here. I, I just want to come back here. Teach and do. <laughs> Teach and do. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say here in any way, at any point, um, uh, um, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. Turn to me. I got it. The command explicitly here is whoever does them and teaches them will be great okay so everyone's tracking there with me oh sir yep. so could we say simple language sir see a very simple language yes. that the law drive us into our salvation could we say could that, that? Could, can you repeat that the law could drive us or could bring us into salvation yes so, yes yeah, so so what i what i don't want to say is that 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 truth is not true because we're going to later on look at places where the law is to drive us to salvation. So I'm not disagreeing with that interpret that use of the law. The law is meant to drive us to Christ. Okay. I'm just disagreeing with it here. Now, if you were an unbeliever looking at this context and the succeeding context, we could use this to drive unbelievers to Christ. Okay, so I'm not saying that's an inappropriate use. I'm I'm merely saying that at the most fundamental interpretation of this context, it's so this is where um the speaker is the speaker is Christ and the the hearer are his disciples. So this is not in a unbelieving context. This is in a this is in a Christian context. This is in a follow, this is in a discipleship context, okay? So because Jesus is giving the, the, these laws to those who are already in him. Now obviously uh obviously it has to presuppose saving faith, right? So so um uh Judas is out, right? 
but this is a Christian context. This is a discipleship context, okay? This is not a unbeliever's context. So if, if an unbeliever were to look at this, for sure we could use it in that sense. Is everyone tracking there with me? Let's just take a, a pause back. Yeah, uh, Pastor Tim, uh, my question is, uh, I'm and I'm having a hard time to to understand the word binding because if, I understand that we are to do and to teach, but if we are to bound someone to the Lord, uh, we include also the punishment, right? And then okay, uh, oh, okay. So no, so yeah, fair enough. So w- there are different. So the word bind, th- there are different uh, uses. There's like a semantic range. So I'm not saying binding in the sense of of being underneath the law and all of its punishments. I'm referring to is the law still binding? Is it st- in a general sense? Is it still uh, applicable to us? Are we still commanded to keep the law? That's the sense in which I'm using, using binding. My second uh, question is, uh, while we were uh, trying to discuss this uh, passage, uh, my mind goes into the rich young ruler. Uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I, 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 I'm kind of leaning to the Lutheran's uh, interpretation that this passage is really pushing us into the corner that we are only to look unto Jesus because no one, yeah, the law yeah, is uh, actually when we talk yeah. about the, the next passage, he, uh, Jesus was uh, elevating the, the laws in murder, the laws in adultery. That's yeah. why it's really pushing us in, in the corner that we are cannot look left and right, but to look up to Jesus alone. I think that's yeah. you know, really uh, what I'm yeah. trying to understand in this passage. Yeah, so no, so that's a great question. But again, I will I will come back to this statement here because this doesn't, and I'll get to you in a second, Kuda Boy. I, again, I'll I'll refer back to here. Whoever does them and teaches them will be great. So again, Jesus doesn't say no one can do this. Just look to me. There is this offering of whoever does them and teaches them will be great. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that in an unbeliever's context, or even because even in a believer's context, we're not perfect, okay? So it doesn't mean that we don't look to Christ, but the Lutherans will say we only look to Christ, we can't do it, okay? I guess that's the nuance. When we say with a Lutheran strict interpretation, they would say we only turn to Christ, but we can't, we lack the ability to do it. What I want to say is, what we want to say is Jesus here is saying, um, yeah, look to me, but the, the, what the accent is on the doing and the teaching. If I don't know if that if that's making sense. Do you want to ask a follow up or? I think that thing is working on it. Just hold your horses, guys. I know he's yeah. into something, because the the fact is though the, though it's true that this this required by Jesus, but I know Jesus is telling us not not to relax on it because we may end up doing the the wrong things like for not following uh, his commandment. Like for example, yeah. do not commit adultery. So you're committing adultery because I cannot I cannot do it on my own. I, I just yeah. have to look up to Jesus. So yeah. don't relax on this. But it does the purpose of doing it is not for you to be saved. There is a reason behind why Jesus is telling us to still follow this one. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So again, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Korean boy, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm just I just want to add to the application or meaning of the word binding. So it would be a little bit clearer to non-lawyers or non-legal persons. As we understood it, when you say it is binding, that means that particular law or contract or agreement is still applicable. You still have to do whatever is the obligation or terms and conditions that are imposed in that agreement or law. And that if you violate or you uh, you fall short of your obligations in the fulfillment of the obligations to that law or that particular agreement or contract, there is a consequence. Yes, and the, yes, the, yes, the, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and so in that technical sense, we would still say there is a consequence, and Jesus paid for it. So 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 there is still a consequence, but Jesus paid for it. So. Yeah, in that sense, it's still binding. It's still we're still using the binding in the right sense, Chalmer. I think that's that's how it applies. While you may commit, while you may be guilty of the violation of the law, but the penalty is paid for by Christ. I think that's the that's the extent or the application to us. It's like 
uh, there's a law, uh, let's say, criminalizing being a member of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Yeah. And then the president says, okay, those who are uh, members of the Communist Party, I exonerate you, no, no longer be in prison, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Something like that. So, so there is now no, no penalty, no consequence, but you but they, still- Yeah, you they still, still have, yeah, they still have to obey the, the, the law. It's not, it's not as yeah. if they said, okay, we're freeing yeah. you and the law is done away with. That's the yeah. big thing. No, excellent question, excellent comment. Yeah. Uh, Corey yeah. excellent, yeah. Okay. Again, go, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Um, again, uh, thank you for clarifying the issues of binding because the way I understand binding here, uh, as I tried to explain last week, is that um, with regards to our spiritual side, the law is no longer binding to us. But with regards to its moral aspect, of course, we are we are bound to 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 follow it. But to say that. You have to follow that, uh, you know, law that has been there recorded or uh, things that is being recorded or um, repeated in the New Testament in order for you to save or salvation or to enter into salvation is is not what, what really the New Testament have in mind. Because spiritually speaking, uh, the law is already fulfilled in Christ. There is an account in Luke chapter 16 verse 16 that uh, the law is until John the law is until John and the kingdom of, and the gospel of the kingdom is now being proclaimed so spiritually speaking the law of Moses is no longer binding with with us but morally speaking because this yeah we have to follow yeah. it in, in Jesus is but, really yeah. expounding that but but again so Sonny I think you're missing the point because no one, no one is saying the the Mosaic Covenant is still binding today. The question is, is the 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 law still in effect? Is it still binding for us? Traditional dispensationalists will say no, it's abrogated. Okay, it's not. It, it's only for it's 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 abrogated for the church, or it's on hold for the church, and then it's going to come back in the millennial kingdom. New Covenant will say. Yeah, it's, 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 it was just a tight pointing to and fulfilled in this greater reality of the law of Christ, but it's no longer binding. It's no longer in effect. That, that's the whole debate. So if, if all you're saying is fulfilled in the sense that you just described, then yeah, you're, you're, you're covenant. You're not new covenant. You're not dispensational because, because that's not the, the issue. The issue is whether or not the law is still binding for us in the church and so we're going to get we're going to get to specifics really? just in the next passage so go ahead someone else someone else want to add yeah so I yeah so that, that's what i uh, I, I really i understood this the, the fulfillment of the law and then what i mean by abrogations of the law is that there are certain certain aspect of the law that really abrogated for example um circumcision uh, as as to abide with the spiritual covenant and also with, uh, you know, you know, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not really con con convinced by the, the baptism as the, the, the new, the new circumcision. But, 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 sorry, that's all. Those are peripheral issues. Those are peripheral issues. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, we, we, we yeah. don't, we don't want to use words like abolish. We don't want to use words like abolish or so these are nullifying, destroying, ending, even abrogate. We don't want to use that word. We want to use the word of 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 oops. We want to use the word of of fulfill. And what yeah, is what is what is fulfilled? But hold on, what is what is fulfilled? Christ completes it. He brings it to the full meaning. I think you weren't here for this part. He, there's also aspects that Christ completes, accomplishes, mm -hmm. and then there's also parts that he does. Okay, mm -hmm. but. But it's in this debate right here what where where the debate is is uh, so if we accept that he's bringing the law to its full meaning and completion, it's still binding or he or he ends it or he gives a different law okay so at least initially looking down here the the law is is we cannot relax the commandments and we can't teach others to to relax them. Mean to say it's not of consequence. You don't have to follow them anymore. Christ has done it. 
that's a bad interpretation. That's applicationally speaking, that applies here. Rather, it's whoever does them and teaches them. Okay, so now we're going to get, so I, I hope everyone really, I've set the table and everyone really understands what's at stake here, okay? Um, the, the, everyone else, just hold your questions. So I think everyone's really kind of, we're kind of bouncing around because we're moving in a direction, okay? So we're moving in a direction. Um, I want to say one other thing here. The, 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 the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, what I want, what I want to highlight here, this is... I've kind of cheated because I've looked at the rest of Matthew to see the answer, okay? Matthew's going to answer these questions, okay? So I'm just going to give you a foretaste that we're going to look at later. This is uh, external versus uh, internal. So again, in this specific instance, Jesus has already called the disciples sons of God. So in Matthew chapter 5, he calls them um, um, um Sons of God, verse number nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, so this is really in a context at the end of Matthew chapter five, who refer to us being perfect, like your heavenly father, like our heavenly Father who is in heaven is perfect. So, so again, technically speaking, we're in a uh, a sonship context, okay, inside the community of faith, okay. And so, what Jesus is calling us to is a a higher level of righteousness, a different kind of righteousness. So let's give one example, and then we're going to go to Matthew 21. So just, just hold your horses. If, if I say to my wife, okay, um, there, the, I, have a, I have a vow with my wife, okay? Our marriage vows are, are to be faithful, okay? And I know, I know I work with unbelievers, and the unbelievers would say, I can, I'm faithful to my wife, as long as I don't have adultery with or sex with anyone else, but I can go to the titty bar. I can go to the, I can go to the, to the, to the strip club. I, I can look. So they would look, I, I can look, I can't touch. That's a saying in the U S maybe it's a saying here. I would think it's the same because we're all men. Okay. That's what they would say. Okay. So what, what we would say is that they have one level of righteousness in their marriage vow. That is, I can look, but I can't touch. As long as I'm not touching, I am in conformity. And what we would say is, no, we have a higher standard. We're, we're not to look, we're not to touch, and we're to control our thoughts. Do you see how we're not dealing with perfection per se? We're dealing with a different level of righteousness. There is one level of righteousness in the marriage sanctu- uh, uh, the marriage relationship where you can look, but you can't touch. There's a higher level where you, you can't touch, you can't look, and you shouldn't be thinking about it. Does everyone see that? And so here, here, this is what Jesus is calling us to. The, the, the scribes and the Pharisees had this external righteousness, but, but that higher level internal was not there. And it's at this level that we now turn to Matthew 5.21. So let's go to Matthew 5.21 now. Matthew 5.21. Matthew 5.21. And so here... G- the debate here is, is Jesus giving new law or is he giving the proper interpretation of the Mosaic law? Okay, so that's the question here. So let's write this question down. So let's look at the first example here, Matthew 5, 21 to 26. For those of you who really know Matthew, I want to look at right now, I want to look at, is Jesus reacting? um, what, What is significant here compared to how elsewhere Matthew deals with the word of God? What is similar or different? Because here, this is clearly, this is clearly, This is clearly a command, right? So does everyone understand what I'm asking here? This is a command from from Exodus. Looking at here, looking at how the word of God is being handled, what what is very interesting in how Jesus describes this? Someone tell me, 
what is the phrase or what is the statement that really helps answer this question? Is Jesus giving new law or the right interpretation? Let's take a moment here. Anyone will have an answer? I would say right interpretation. I would say interpretation. It's not a new law. It's not a new command. It's the same command. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. It's the same as the old. So, yeah. So, number one, we have, we have, we have, the law doesn't change, right? Law does not change. Koya Boboy or anybody, what inside that, that bracketed phrase, comparing it to elsewhere in Matthew or even in the rest of, 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 of Scripture, what makes you think that Jesus is reacting to an interpretation and not the law itself? So what people will say, just to be clear, is people will say, Jesus is looking at the law and he's going to change it or he's, go, he's going to, to increase it or he's going to do something to it, okay? You have heard. Yes. Uh, Danny, Danny, go ahead. Elaborate. Jesus, Jesus, was uh, just observing. Jesus was observant of what they are doing and what he was hearing, explaining why they are doing what they are doing. I think that's, that's the key to what he is now saying. You're saying this, you're saying that, but you're doing this. Okay, that's really good, Corey Bobby. Let's let's Danny give your answer and then we'll we'll draw it together. So Danny, go ahead. When Jesus said you have heard that it was said of those old, meaning uh it's not uh, first hand. I just heard people just heard it. What people that we just look at and what do we call that? What what people uh, were probably it, saying this again. in the Philippines is chismis. <laughs> Who is that here? So who is that here? We're focused. We're in context. Who is the who is the person that Jesus is referring to? Someone give me a name. Give me maybe a the, name. Maybe the, the Pharisee. Jew. The Jews. The, the Pharisee. The the Jews. The, the the Jews during the time of Jesus. Okay. And what was so he's talking about hearing? What what do we call? What if they were hearing something from? What do you call that? What do you call the Pharisees and the scribes? They're saying something. What do we call that? Someone give me a technical name. Teaching. You were taught. Okay, they teaching, were... yes, but I want the technical name from Matthew. Anyone have it for me? Come on, be strong. Malakas, who is it? Who is it? Traditions. The traditions. Okay. Liba? The traditions. And so, so we're going to go there in a moment. Or we could say we specifically oral. Oral traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees. Look for that word. It's there. Okay, so Jesus is not reacting to the law itself, but he is reacting to, you have heard. It was said. <laughs> Just miss what, what, what Danny was saying. Okay, and we can be sure of this because how does Jesus and how does Matthew refer to the, to, to refer to the, the scripture over and over again? What is the famous words of Matthew? It is written. It is written. Very malakas. If Jesus had said, you have seen that it was written, but I, but, but I say to you, or, or write this down, I would say, okay, he's changing, he's changing the law. He's changing the law. But it's not. So Jesus is, the law is there, Diba. The law is there. Let's just, let's just, the law is there. You have, you have the, the, the oral tradition of the Pharisees and the scribes. And then you have Jesus. And they're both, what are they doing? Interpreting. 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 The right interpretation. The right interpretation, Sigurado. Look at this here. Watch. So look at this. You shall not, you have you have heard. You shall not murder, you shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable of judgment. Okay. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable of the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable of hellfire. So if you have an offering, uh, if you are offering your gift at the altar, then remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift before you go to the altar. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. 
<laughs> lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge uh, to the guard and put you in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid every last penny. And so what Jesus is saying here is what? He's saying here that this is, this is internal. Not just external. So someone who didn't murder their brother, but hated their brother, was not actually obeying the intent of the Decalogue. Any question or, or pushback? Everyone sees that there? Enti, go ahead. So, so with regards with uh, with regard to the to what you said, that this is really pointing the traditions because most thinking is we are thinking about. Uh, um, the, the, the scribes, hmm. the teachers of, of the law. So uh, this really refers to what the, the Mishnah, yeah. uh, their, their book on the interpretation of the law. Okay, I'm just trying to clarify that. Yeah, so, so but, 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 view, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim, from our point of view, when we study criminal law, we do not only consider the external act. The most important there is the internal motive. We call it the intent, the criminal intent. We call it malice. Yeah. There must be a criminal intent to go with the external action. Yeah. Because sometimes the external action can be justified. Yeah. But if the internal motive, like what they call this, uh, the, the intent, is really from the beginning is already malicious or evil, then the external is just the result. Yeah. You just consider the external as the result of what happened in the internal. That's why yeah. the angry, I think Jesus was really a good teacher in, 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 in connecting that your murder, the root of that murder is the anger inside. So yeah. he's connecting what is inside you that causes you to get to, to do the murder. So the external act was just the result of what is inside. I think yeah. that's the way that he's explaining here. No. Excellent point, Koyo Boboy. Excellent point. And, and the proof is also in the word. There is a word for kill and there is a word for murder in Hebrew. And it's so interesting that the Hebrew word is not kill, it's murder. And so murder implies intent. You're absolutely right. And so a, a surface reading, someone who's playing games can just say, oh, as long as you don't murder, you're, you're obeying the, the, law, the law. But, but to not recognize that intent, which is what our laws are already designed. They're looking, of course, we can't judge the heart. That's imperfect, but you're looking internally. But the scribes and the Pharisees, I, we will prove, you will see this tonight. They did not care about the internal. <laughs> it was a bad, it was a bad tr uh, translation. So what, what the, the concluding mark we want to see here is that Jesus is, is getting to the heart issue of the law. He's getting to the heart issue. So we could say that... Um, he is not abrogating. He hasn't abrogated. He's tightened it. <laughs> Do you see that? The law has not been abrogated. It's not been ended. He hasn't said, I fulfilled it. Don't worry about it. You're good to go. Just look to me. He's really calling them to this higher standard. I hope everyone sees that. You can't get away from that. Okay. That's not to say we shouldn't, when we fail, we shouldn't turn to Christ. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is the primary point here is what we're emphasizing here is that this law is still in effect. It's, it, it hasn't been ended. It hasn't been just brought to accomplishment in Christ, and that's it. It's still in effect that we need to follow. Okay? That, that's really the point. Uh, Chalmer, go ahead. Yeah, one question, Pastor Tim, uh, as I understand uh, where the discussion is going. Yeah. I, just one question in my mind uh, regarding the external and internal. Yeah. With the statement you have made uh, previously a while ago, is it possible that a man can internally and externally righteous without Jesus? No, absolutely not. And then, absolutely uh, not. Yeah. Uh, because the righteousness have said uh, is has been mentioned here is uh, above uh, only that is beyond the the. Uh, what they call it, beyond the righteousness of the scribes and uh, the Pharisees. I understand yeah. that it's internal and external. So that is why uh, our, our, my statement, it will go back uh, again uh, a while ago that actually this is really pointing to Jesus. The, the whole, the whole uh, point of the law is Jesus Christ. We obey because of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because so, so, 
Yeah, but so Tomer, let me just put a pause there. So mm -hmm. this this is why we also have to bring, we're bringing in all of what we've already seen. The, so even we talked about that the law, the Old Testament had the grace and gospel component built into it in the sacrificial system. So every time there's a sacrifice, we were seeing the grace and the work of, 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 of God and then ultimately in Christ. So again, looking at this context, even the law did not demand perfection. There was a, a, a place for a sacrifice. Did you see what I'm saying? So, you know, um, we're not talking about the theological issue. Chalmer, maybe this is helpful. We're not talking about the theological truth. We're talking about, number one, um, this context. And number two, the relationship of, of whether or not the law is still in effect today. I guess that's really the question that I'm focusing on. I, am I making sense? I'm trying to internalize it, Pastor Tim. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, in, in, yeah, go ahead. Here in this world, in this world, we are either slave to sin or slave to righteousness. Yes, yes. Romans so 6. It's, Romans, uh, 6. It's Romans 6, 16 to, nine, uh, to 20. In, in 20, Romans 6, 20, it's, since we are slave, uh, we are in Christ. We are slave yeah. to righteousness. Yeah. So yes, the yes. Uh, the law the law is still in effect to us. Yes, yes. Tama, yeah. tama, tama. Yeah, yeah. Would, so, yeah. Go ahead. Would it would it be would it be appropriate to say that the right interpretation that is now being explained by Jesus is actually expanding the application of the law? Yeah, it's. He's, he's making explicit what was always there. He is simply making explicit what was always there and what was the intent, but the Pharisees had corrupted the intent. And so he's coming on the scene saying, no, th this is the intent and this is in actuality what it should be. Chalmer, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just uh, internalized that. You, you mentioned it's not uh, theological or the way we understand it. So... Am I understanding this morally, or is it some kind of a uh, universal law? If, if this is not theologically way in understanding this, no. So what I'm trying to get at, Chalmer, is you're asking a question about um, the theological truth that no one can be saved without the work of Christ, without the Spirit, without grace. Okay. What I'm trying to emphasize is that here we're looking at exegetically what's being said and what the primary purpose was of 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 jesus christ and what i'm trying to say here is it is a hundred percent true jesus would say you have to be a son of god in order to to receive salvation you have to have the work of spirit you have to have faith absolutely but in this context jesus's primary purpose was what is the law for us to follow is that making sense so Jesus's purpose was dealing with corrupt views of the law um, um, in his day. He's not at this point primarily thinking about how to get in. He's dealing with corrupt views. Now, of course, there is that is related. So the Pharisees are out because they're not even their righteousness is not even there. But but he's addressing with corrupt views of the law primarily. Okay, does that make sense? Or that's still you're still. Um, Antti, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, so I, I think when we look at even in, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the, the command has always been to love the Lord our God with all our hearts. And the Old Testament, um, every step of the way, has proven that the problem is the heart because uh, the Lord has uh, repeatedly showed them grace. Uh, but their hearts were corrupted. Yeah. And the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, tells us that uh, when God cleanses us, he would also put his spirit in us yeah. uh, that we may obey the law. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the, the, uh, the, the problem that the Old Testament sets. So when we get to the New Testament, when Jesus... Uh, fulfilled all these things it has also paved the way for the spirit to be in us uh, and and having said that one the spirit would bring would put the the, the law in our hearts mm -hmm. so that uh, we obey from from the heart to our yeah. actions so yeah. the law 
has never been the problem. Like it will change later. Yeah. The problem is the heart, and it was addressed by the giving of the Spirit, so that yeah. um, we obey God, not like the Pharisees, yeah. which is merely external, uh, but rather we will obey now from a changed heart. Yeah. Um, the commands yeah. of the Lord is not. Is not burdensome. Yeah. So the laws still apply, yeah. but we are, yeah. we obey it from yeah. the heart now because we have a change. Yeah. Maybe I can approach this another way, Chalmer. Okay. I I'm not disagreeing with the truth that this should draw us, us to Christ. So someone who is an unbeliever that reads this, Chalmer, a hundred percent, it should drive them to Christ. I'm not saying that that could not be an application. Okay. What I'm saying, though, is that the primary purpose, the primary application doesn't concern driving someone to Christ, although that can be used for sure, but it's dealing with every, let's just use another example. Everyone's in the church and they say to the pastor, what is the, what is the pattern of life we should follow? Okay. And so then there's different views out there and someone's saying, just do the external, just give tithes, just don't commit murder, just do this or that. And, and other people are saying, well, no, you got to do this. And then the, the pastor says, no, no, sit down. This is the commands you should follow. And then he lays it out for them. Okay. That's the primary context for sure. As he lays out the commands, maybe someone's like, yo, I can't do this. Like I need, and the pastor say, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go make that confession. Okay. So I'm not saying we can't use that for sure. If I were to preach this, Chalmer, if I were to preach this, this sermon, there would be a time where I would call people to repent of their sin and to trust in Jesus, okay? So I'm not saying you can't ap apply a Lutheran interpretation. Um, what I am saying is that the primary interpretation, the primary purpose of Jesus was addressing what is the law and wh what commands we are to follow. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Is, is that uh, clarify? It's it actually uh, I'm getting it, but okay. that's why I, I'm I was going back to my question. Is it really possible that someone who can be internal and externally righteous without Christ? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it possible? I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, absolutely not. Internally and externally righteous. They, they, they what what NT said. They have to have the spirit. They have to turn. They so have to turn. It's not possible. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the simple answer, it's not possible. It's impossible, yeah. So someone someone without the work of Christ, without the work of the Spirit, without the Spirit giving them the new birth, they could not do this. And so in, in them seeing this, they would, if, if the Spirit was at work in their heart, they their, their response would not be like, I can do this. Their response would be, um, what must I do to be saved? Okay. That's what we call mutually exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. And so that is, so let's be clear, that is one of the purposes we're going to see later for the law, okay? So, um, but here again, um, Jesus is addressing with dealing with uh, correcting bad interpretations of the law, okay? It is already 723. Let's take a 10-minute break. This is crazy. I don't even know if we're going to get to all the content. This is, this is insane. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break, though. T take a break, go to the bathroom, go to the CR. Just, just. Just a perspective on the on the on the on the conversation of whether or not the law is still binding. Um, what happens is that those who said that the law is no longer applicable to us today, it it seems to suggest that the problem is in the law, yeah, instead of the heart, and that's why. Let's remove the law because there's problem. No, there's no problem. What would you remo remove the law when it is perfect? The problem in yeah. all of the Old Testament yeah. is not the law. Why would you remove it? The, what, will, what needs to be removed is the heart of stone yeah. and be changed to, into a heart of flesh. So when Jesus came paving the way to, to fulfillment and the giving of the Holy Spirit, then there would be a change of heart. Yeah. So now we can obey the law the way it should be. Yeah, obeyed, uh, though not still perfectly. So yeah. it, it's just crazy that, that, the, that the conversation seems to suggest that let's remove the law as if the problem is the law instead yeah. of the heart is the problem. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. The, way, I think, that's the way it yeah. is explained why, why the heart of men are the, we have depravity. We, we tend to contrive things so that we can be excused of what we are doing 
So with the with the law abrogated or there's no law that will say what you are doing is wrong, then we can do anything we like. That's, yeah. that's the purpose of the of the attack on the law. Mm. That's the purpose. So if yeah, you remove uh, the law, then I am free. I can do anything I want. Yeah. Would you like it's, that? It's coming from an unregenerated heart. <laughs> yeah, I agree with 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 that's not Pastor what, Enting and Kuyabu. That is how that is how Paul described the depravity. How how the the heart of of man has has gone downwards. Right, right. I agree. Actually, I agree. But some, but somehow, uh, what I'm internalizing to to the discussion is that we are inclined more on to obey the law than the changing of our hearts. That's what I'm really having the uh, the, the confusion. Yeah, because, because the, uh, the contention we, of the yeah, law I agree with the Old Testament. Was the Old I agree Testament with in, that if you obey the law, you will be saved? Yeah, I agree with Pastor Enting that the law is not the problem. Actually, I agree with that. It's the heart. But in our discussion, actually, it seems to suggest that the obedience and yeah, the the right. I don't, I don't, I I, don't, I have have, uh, don't have the words to put it in. But it seems to suggest that we are to obey the law more than changing our heart. Legalistically, legalistically, I think that's the third. But so here's so here's yeah here this big way so that's the 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 thing that we need to follow the law for us to be to be righteous in a legalistic way. No 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 no. I think that is not that is not how it should be. But but how it should be. Yeah, because attorney, ang ano magtawala ang focus sa heart na 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 we will become more focused following the law. As Enting said, as Enting has said. It should result in the change of heart so that we can obey the law and we can do we can be righteous. Do not if we do it the other way around. That is not that is not the correct interpretation uh, as as now explained by in Matthew. Anything yeah. is right in the in that direction. You have to appreciate that the law must be there so that there will be change of heart so that we can obey properly and rightfully. Not. We obey the law so that we can be right. You cannot be righteous. We cannot be righteous. Oh, we'll go back to my question late, uh, a while ago. So what's the role of the law? I think uh, Tim said he will answer it later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because it's not yet answered yet. What's the role yeah. of the law in this in our, in, in our discussion, in this discussion? So what's the, the role of the law now? Okay. Yeah, with so, regards also to, to the question that uh, if the righteousness, we are to be above the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes, And the discussion goes on to the internal and external following of the law. So that's that's really uh, legalistic. Hopefully, yeah. you, you get what we're we're saying. Uh, the righteous that is above the Pharisees and the scribes seems to suggest in this discussion that it's the obedience of the law still. Yeah, the the uh, our righteousness will exceed that of the. Pharisees, of course, first it is founded in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But secondly, on practical sense, um, it will exceed the, the, the righteousness of the Pharisees because the Pharisees are like a show. It's just external. But when we get to know Jesus, our, our, our righteousness is from the heart because of the Holy Spirit. It's not a show. There's genuineness in it. That we really love that the, the commands of the Lord are not burdensome. So, like when I was a young, um, my parents have to be there beside me just so that I would study. It's like I just don't want to do it. But but right now, I love to study. It it's more like um, you just do it because there's some stick. <laughs> You'll be spunk if you'll not do it, as opposed to you love to do it. So when when the Holy Spirit is in us, we love to obey God. We are not obeying because of fear. We are not obeying because we will not be accepted if we will not obey. We are obeying because we love God, and we simply love to obey Him. Yep. Okay, I think so. We're gonna. I like what Pastor Enting said. I'm gonna I'm gonna piggyback that. Perhaps my failure is that we did not set the table. Um, we did not properly set the table in the Gospel of Matthew. So, is everyone back? Is is everyone back? Everyone's back. 
Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the table before we continue our discussion so that we see that both Matthew and also Jesus, this is not in the context of earning salvation. So I'm gonna make this very clear. This is in the context of, to be fair, it's in the context of everyone who's saying that they are in Christ, they are followers of God, and some are, some are, some are, some are we got bad actors and good actors. So let's look, go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter three. So I want to, I want to set the table just to um, um, emphasize that this is not in a, um, a works based, although Matthew is emphasizing a, uh, what the, the law is and how we should practice. Um, so let's go to Matthew chapter three. I'm just going to read the beginning of, 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 of Matthew in Matthew one. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of work through Matthew ultra quick, okay? So you stay in Matthew three. Um, the promise of the coming of the son of David, the son of God. So just to highlight really quick, so we see that this is not a, Matthew and even Jesus, they're not looking at this in, in works base, although the law is being emphasized in Matthew five, six, and seven, and elsewhere in Matthew, okay? So, um, son of David is there. So this is the promise of the Messiah. Um, she's conceived by the Holy Spirit. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So, <laughs> God with us, okay? So, clearly, at the outset, if you're reading Matthew in context, you cannot come away with a works-based salvation, okay? This is setting up the context of what Jesus will do, okay? So coming down here to, to, to now to the work of, of John. John chapter 3. The fundamental message of John is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And um, uh, in Mark, the message of Jesus, which is the same as John, is repent and believe, okay? And so... Uh, we're not going to, to discuss this exegetically, but essentially, in many instances, um, what's going on here is that this concept of repent, if you can imagine, this is a coin. This is a coin. We're looking at the side of a coin, okay? So on this side of the coin is repentance, and this side is faith. So is everyone tracking... I'm looking at the coin. So if you turn the coin, it's like this. So let me just, um, let's just say this was a coin. Okay, this is a coin here. I've turned the coin sideways. So you can see both sides. Okay, so what I'm trying to get at is this word repent implies faith. Or so Paul will often say believe. That implies repentance. Okay, we don't have time to go in there. But so, but, but that's essentially what's going on. So G John's fundamental message is one of repentance. Okay. Coming down here, they were baptized in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So again, uh, no one is going to Jesus' teaching saying we can do this ourselves, okay? Clearly, there's this highlighting of this confessing of sins, okay? Everyone tracking there with me? But this is the context. He says to many uh, scribes and Sadducees, you children of vipers, <laughs> You children of Satan, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Look at the command. Bear fruit in keeping with your repentance, okay? So this is the context, okay? So uh, what does Jesus say now? There's much more that John said. Jesus says, Jesus comes teaching, proclaiming the gospel, and healing. Threefold ministry. So again, Jesus is not uh, Jesus is not um, just teaching on morality, saying you can you can pull yourselves up by the bootstraps and get in. Okay, he's proclaiming the gospel, but he's also teaching, and he's also healing. All right, so uh, this signifies undoing the curse. Um, Dibaso, a curse brings sickness and death. The the healing is a sign of the, the, the blessings of a coming covenant, okay? But what I want us to see here is that this is going to be highlighted here, okay? So it's in this context of teaching that Matthew is, is going on. 
And if we're looking at the law, he's highlighting the issues with the scribes and Pharisees, their bad interpretation and a right interpretation. How ought a disciple of Jesus to live? Everyone tracking there? So that's the context. Okay, so no one can say Jesus is teaching, pull it up by your bootstraps, get into heaven. No, okay? He is highlighting how we ought to live. So if you're looking at imputed righteousness versus uh, moral righteousness, the accent in the Sermon on the Mount is on this moral righteousness, this how ought a disciple of Jesus to live. So everyone's there. Everyone's there, okay? Everyone's everyone's good? Everyone sees that? All right, so let's go now back to the context here. So a disciple of Jesus doesn't just worry about not murdering someone. A disciple of Jesus is also focused on not being angry, okay? So a disciple of Jesus is trying to follow commands of not just murdering, but also not being angry, okay? Um, Number two, you have heard that it was said. So again, <clears throat> addressing tradition. Do not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. So has Jesus abrogated the command of adultery? No, he's tightened it. He's given a higher level of righteousness. Jesus' disciples, they just don't worry about committing adultery or fornicating, they're also focused on not having this lustful intent. Jesus' disciples, in following his commands, are focused more on the internal and the external, okay? We're going to get there, okay? Everyone tracking there? So again, um, the law is not abrogated. It's not done away with. It's tightened. It's clarified. And then he gives a warning. So essentially here, he's tightening the law. Again, he's clarifying the command is not abrogated. It's tightened. So what we can at least say up until Matthew 530, okay, the commands that Jesus is giving, he's literally giving the commands of the law with a lock tight internal external interpretation. Does everyone see that? Is everyone tracking there with me? Whoever relaxes and teaches will be least in the kingdom. Whoever, whoever does, you can't miss that. Dibat, you can't miss that. Everyone sees that? Uh, looking at Matthew 5, Matthew 5, uh, 18 and 19, it seems to fit perfectly. Okay, everyone tracking? Matthew 5, 31, the, uh, the issue of divorce. It has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, we don't have time to go there. Uh, The passage that Jesus is referring to is Deuteronomy 24. Let me write this down. And in this context, if someone marries a woman and there's some indecency is found in her, so he has not been having sex with her, they get married and maybe in the act or maybe it becomes known that there was something indecent. And so Deuteronomy allowed for the provision that he could put away his wife before they had really consummated, okay? But people were abusing it like crazy. They were saying, because the law wasn't, really specific and that didn't deal with explicitly intent people were abusing this divorce law they were it was crazy and so jesus is saying this is the command only on the grounds of sexual immorality can you divorce someone and if you divorce them and marry another you're committing adultery so again he's tightening do you see this he's tightening He hasn't abrogated saying, okay, don't worry about divorce anymore. I got you. That's no longer binding for you. You, you can divorce whoever you want, except on the grounds of sexual immorality. So this is the this is the this is the condition. If you divorce someone, 
and she hasn't committed sexual adult. Uh, uh, she hasn't committed sexual morality. You're you make her commit a, you make her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery, except on this ground. So this is a tightening of a law that's still in effect. So so far we're three for three. The command is not abrogated. It's not fulfilled in Jesus. He says nothing about it. He doesn't say, I fulfilled. You guys are good to go. My disciples will not divorce except on the grounds of sexual immorality. That's how my disciples operate. My disciples don't commit adultery in their mind. My disciples don't have anger in their heart. Again, not perfect. It doesn't Jesus has come to save his people from their sins. So not perfect, but they are committed to following this pattern. Look at this. 533, again, you have heard that it has been said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the great city of the king. Do not take an oath, by your head, for you cannot make your hair white or black. Rather, so this is the command, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more comes from evil. So here would be another example. Oh, Jesus is changing the law. Let's look at these passages to see if Jesus is changing the law or simply enforcing the intent. Let's go first to Exodus Exodus, uh, uh, sorry, Leviticus 19.12. Leviticus 19.12. So look at this here. You shall not swear by my name falsely and, and so profane the name of the Lord. I am the Lord. So the command is not to swear falsely. And so the implication is, well, you can swear, you just can't swear falsely. But the, this whole point is that whatever you say, you have to do, right? So... So the swearing is because you're trying to keep your word or to do something. Here the command is don't swear falsely. You, you're profaning the name of the Lord your God if you swear falsely. Uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 23, verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you. You, you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vow, if you refrain from vowing, vowing, you will not be guilty. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised from your youth. Okay? So people will say, Jesus is now rescinding this command for vowing. Okay? But if you look at the intent here, what's the intent? The intent is just to do what you say. <laughs> the whole intent, right? It's just do what you say. No need for a vow, right? Just do it, okay? That's the intent. Look at what Jesus says here. Let what you say be yes or no. Anything more comes from evil. So he hasn't rescinded. He's merely giving the intent. The intent remains the same. The whole point of a vow is to really make it sure, to really make it sure. But if I don't vow, I don't have to come through. That was the issue. And we're going to see that in the Pharisees. They would say, if you swear by the temple, you don't have to come through with what you say. But ah, if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you have to do it. <laughs> and Jesus was like, don't even worry about swearing. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. The original intent. So again, Jesus is not, Jesus is actually tightening the law here because he's saying, whether you vow or not, you've got to do it. So whether there's a vow or not, you don't need to, the, the, the command for vow is not necessary because no matter what you do, you you have to do your yes and your yes and your no is your no. So this is a tight, this is again, I hope we see this. This is a tightening. Tightening of the 
command. Law seems to still be in effect, my brothers. I don't see it changing much. I don't see it changing much when you actually look at the content. It seems to be tightening. It seems to be like, this is the rage. He's like, ah, I got you. Look at this. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the, the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the, the other also. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Whoever... Uh, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So again, here people say, see, the Lord has removed this, uh, removed this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, okay? Um, let's look at the context to see if that's really the case. Or this was, again, Jesus is not quoting the law, but the abuse of the law. So let's go to... Um, Exodus 21, 24, Exodus 21, 24. So look at the context, okay? When men strive together and they hit a pregnant woman, so as her child comes out, but no harm is done, the one who hit shall surely be fined, as the woman shall oppose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, foot for foot, burn for bone, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. This is justice. This doesn't, this hasn't changed. Jesus is not ending this, okay? Th this is in the context of injury to a woman. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Look at the context here. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you in your right cheek, turn also to the other. This is not in the context of a woman being injured, a child being injured or killed. This is in the context of, of, of um, personal vendettas, grudges, the father going back and forth. Some of them, slap, ah, slap. You know, do you see what I'm saying? This, is, this was an abuse of the, the right justice. That's, that's true justice. If someone injures someone, their child, they accidentally kill the child, there should be a payment um, to maintain justice. So what we want to see here is that the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in judicial court was not being abolished, but the abuse of the law for personal vendettas. <laughs> you see that? Um, or people's excuse for not giving to the poor. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Again, that is not in the context of what we just read. Did you, you see this? This was, this was being used in other contexts, most likely the, the oral traditions of the Pharisees. They were using this in all these other contexts. And Jesus is saying, that's, that's corrupt. That is wrong. So Jesus is not abrogating eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in that original context, but in abuse of it. Now, perhaps you disagree. There's debate here. Fair enough. But I think when you look at that context compared to this context, it's clearly a different context. They were abusing. They were abusing it. And actually what one commentary said that the, the law, the, the lex telionis law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, was to protect from over justice. So someone was having a vendetta. They're like, maybe, maybe, maybe someone's eye was poked out. And so he's like, I'm going to take both your eyes. You know, and they, maybe they used a, a judge to do that. He's saying, no, it's just eye for an eye. It was preventing excessive justice, excessive um, vindic uh, uh, vindictiveness. Whereas here, they're just using this for, for, for grudges. They were using... Lex Telionis to abuse their neighbor over personal grudges or to, to or to, to be exempted from um, helping the poor. Um yeah, uh, I'm I'm you you are saying that the, the law in the uh, actually it's in Exodus, it is not connected with this law that Jesus uh, was pertaining here because it is a sense of injustice, right? The context of uh, uh, right justice or over use of justice in their own gain, but uh, my 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 points here is when Jesus said, "But I say to you, uh, where's the justice and the one turning your cheek on the other side?" Uh, relates to 
the justice of eye and for an eye and uh in this context Iba, this is specifically in the context of the the pregnant woman that's a different context than here where someone you have an argument and someone slaps you Iba, that's a different context so if if there was an injury now this is debated but if there was a, an injury we could we could have a discussion or you you'd look at the law of how that would be applied but what i what i'm trying to emphasize here is that they were using this statement in for these um for these quarrels and jesus is saying no don't hit them back so what was happening with my disciples don't hit back. So you're having a, a disagreement and someone slaps you in the face and you're like, ah, slapping them back. Lex Teleotis, I have the right. Eye for an eye, right? And Jesus is saying, no, my disciples don't do that. There's an argument. Someone slaps, you turn the other cheek. It's in the context of these, of, of, of these disagreements, right? Um, someone suing you for your tunic, give the other. It's not... What I'm saying is they were abusing the lex talionis in, in the context of legitimate injustice for, for these, these external quarrels. Does that make sense, Chalmer? Yeah, um, you know, Mike, I, I'm kind of confused because you're saying it's in the context of the pregnant woman. And yeah, then yeah. I don't seem to see in the, the verse the context of the quarrels. Yeah, I'm saying, so this, is a, yeah, I'm saying this is a different context. So Jesus is saying, the, 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 so the, what the Pharisees were doing was the Pharisees, the Pharisees, just to be clear, the Pharisees were taking the, the, the eye for an eye. It's like, is, saying, it's like saying nowadays, don't take the law into your hands. Yeah, that could be an example. That could be an example. They were taking this and applying it to personal quarrels. And Jesus was saying, that's a wrong, that's a wrong interpretation. What do you do in personal quarrels? Let the other side be slapped. Do you see what I'm saying? And if someone slaps you in a quarrel, let them slap the other. That's how my disciples respond. So uh, um, respond without retaliation. Could we also say, Pastor Tim, that they respond with humility? Yeah, so we could say that. So, yeah, so, no, that, that's good. So the Pharisees were saying, apply this law in this context. And, and Jesus is saying, no. That's wrong. This is the context. Respond with, sorry, without, without. And so you could also refer to humility as well, for sure. This is, this is humility. Yeah, absolutely. So Jesus is saying, go ahead. Humility is mercy. Yeah, and for sure, mercy. We could include mercy as well. Respond in mercy. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a team. Yeah, go ahead, Joe Mark. Uh, is it uh, relates to the verse 20, uh, same chapter, verse 20? It says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Meaning to say, uh, uh, obeying the law for the sake of uh, justification is, is uh, unacceptable with Jesus. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, if you can just mute because there's feedback. No, I think that's a, that's a, this also, all of what we're doing applies to that, that different level of righteousness, Joe Marso, for sure. That's an excellent application here. That's an excellent application here. Yeah. Last, last, last. You have, you have, uh, go, 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 yeah, go ahead, Henry. Okay. Uh, this verse, eye for an eye, tooth for a teeth. Okay. Where's that? What verse that? Eye for if this applies only to the situation where the mother and child are affected, other than beyond that mother and child, this is not applicable. Yeah, that is correct. That is correct. 
now, now perhaps there's other, like with theft, there is other similar type things. There are specific punishment, but yes, the technical application is with the pregnant woman. Eye for an eye, two for two. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they were taking that and abusing it to, to like personal offenses. Yeah. And Jesus say that, that is abuse. That's not, that's not the right use of the law. My disciples don't act like that. Turn the other cheek. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, last one. Last one here. I think here is really going to see this clear. You've heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <laughs> if, ever, if ever, look at me, everyone. If ever there is an abuse of scripture, this is it. There is nowhere in the Old Testament to say hate your enemy. Nowhere does it say that. They were straight up adding. They were straight up adding. So the, the, we don't have time to go there. Leviticus 19, 18. It, there is the command. There is the command to, to love your neighbor. That is, that is in Leviticus. Leviticus 19, 18. There is no reference to hate your enemy. <laughs> And what we're going to see is that Jesus is teaching on loving your neighbor includes your enemies because your, 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 your enemies are your neighbors as well. And so we see that. We see that with the Good Samaritan. We see that throughout Jesus' teachings. And so if ever we were to say, um, look at this, so that, you may be so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain and just rain on the just and unjust. Mercy, mercy. What 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 Koya Bobo said, mercy. This is this is a merciful, a merciful God. Long suffering. Merciful and long suffering. And we 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 fall into this trap. We love our enemies. We love our we love our friends and hate our enemies. We, but we are called to love our neighbor. And who is my neighbor? Your enemy is your neighbor. And so I think if ever, I think we can see here, Jesus does not is not comprehensive. But what I think there's enough case examples here for us to see what Jesus is doing, and he's giving us a pattern that he hasn't ended the law, he hasn't abolished the law, he's given a right interpretation that focuses not on the external, but the internal, and it's dealing specifically with, with true, it's dealing specifically with true morality. For us to say, oh, well, we gotta sacrifice this way, or oh, we gotta have this certain fest, feast, totally misses the point. This is dealing with true morality and true righteousness. One where there is uh, um, righteousness is internal and then it's moving external. Everyone tracking there with me? Now, that's what I've said. That's what I've said. And you can say, Tim, I don't agree with you. Uh, I, I think that, that, that that's a bad interpretation. Now I'm going to try to convince you that it's a good interpretation. Okay, so let's go now to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Four. This so is so big. This so is so big. Whatever you wish others to do to you, this is a command here. This is a command. Do to them. Why? Reason. For this is the law and the prophets. <laughs> command. How do we summarize the law and the prophets? Summarize the Old Testament. With reference to what we should do morally, with reference to what we should do moral, morally, the focus here is on moral righteousness. Whatever you wish others to do to you, 
do also to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Do also to them. Is it still binding? Is it still an effect? It is binding. You cannot escape. You cannot escape it. Okay, we're going to move quickly here. I want to look at the rest of Matthew, and I want to I want to confirm this interpretation. I want to confirm this interpretation. There is so much more we could go to in Matthew and other places, but I want to confirm this. Um, because again, dispensationals will say, oh, this teaching, this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, it was just for the, the kingdom. The kingdom has been postponed. We have a different law, the law of Christ. I think the same, the new covenant would say as well. Um, so let's see if the, the, the moral aspects of the law have not changed. They are still in effect. They have not changed. So let's, let's, let's answer this question, okay? So let's go now to um, uh, Matthew 15. So I've, I've told you that the issue is with, with the traditions of the Pharisees. So this is still in the context of Matthew. So let's look at Matthew 15. We're just going to read here. And we're going we're gonna to just keep coming back to Jesus teaching on right application of the law versus wrong. And then we're going to come to a climax. We're going to come to a climax in um, the end of Matthew, okay? The Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus. They said, why do your disciples break? Look at this. This is so arrogant. Why do they break the traditions of the elders? We talked about this, right? The, the, the oral tradition, you've heard it said. For they do not wash with their hands when they eat. So uh, the issue is one of hand washing. Is that internal or external? External. External. Jesus responds, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? Look at this. The commandments of God. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. Where is that command? His commandment. Sure. The first commandment with the promise. Honor your father and your mother. So the command was to honor. So for God commanded, honor your father and your mother. Is that still binding? It doesn't seem to be abrogated. If we're following the pattern that Jesus laid out in the Sermon on the Mount, it's still binding. Uh for God commanded, honor your father and your mother. Whoever reviles your father must surely die. So this is, this is a, uh, we could say here perhaps, uh, this is, a, this is a, a different command, but this could be an application. An application elsewhere in the, in the, the law, we won't go there. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God. <laughs> he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So the command of God was to honor and respect your mother and father. And what they were saying is, what mom and dad, whatever I was going to give to you, I've given it to God. <laughs> That's the tradition. It's okay. No problem. So disrespectful. He says, your tradition has broken. You've made void the word of God. Where is Jesus? Jesus, this is an example of your tracing, right? So, so this is an example of your tracing, right? Look here. Command is connected with revelation, word of God. Everyone see that? You see that connection there? That's one point for you already, okay? Um, you hypocrites. Isaiah did well to prophesy of you. There's another one, Jesus. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Is that a New Testament reference? That's an Old Testament reference, right? So even in Isaiah, there is this external, internal prophecy. In vain they do worship me, teaching the doctrines of commandments of men. And he called the people to them and said, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. His disciples came and said, the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying. Look at this. 
This again is your grace. So Chalmer, this here is a reference to grace of God, the work of God. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Monergistic salvation here. <laughs> We're not planting ourselves, right? The, the true plants of God are planted by God. <laughs> he uproots, right? The, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cast, is chopped down and cast into the fire, okay? So this could be a reference again to the grace of God in salvation. Let them alone, they're blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, they fall into a pit. Explain the parable to us, Peter said. Are you without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what proceeds from the mouth, this defiles a person. From out of the, the, the heart comes Mangakapatid. What are these? Where do we see murder? The Decalogue, Viva, where do we see adultery? The Decalogue, theft, false witness, slander. This is in the Decalogue. We could at least say this is from Jesus' teachings, Viva, his application in Matthew 5. These are all coming from the Decalogue. If this is the intent, if this is the intent, right? Everyone tracking there with me? Internal. So what we see here is Jesus is explicitly pitting his view of the law compared to the Pharisees' view of the law. And all the examples here, you wouldn't say Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual murder, that's all new. That's there. That's there already. It's not Hindi, Hindi Bago. It's Lumana. It's there. Come on. It's there. Let's go now to uh, Matthew, Matthew 22 in verse 34. Matthew 22 in verse 34. So this is parallel to the other question for Mark, for Mark uh, 12. We're just going to look at this because it's a parallel passage, and I'm keeping the theme of Matthew so it's consistent. But when the Pharisees heard that he was silenced by the, by the Sadducees, he gathered together a lawyer, a lawyer to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment? What is the great commandment? And he said to them, you shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is the great Shema. This was given to Israel in Deuteronomy 6. Is it still in effect for us? Are we still commanded to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Now, Sonny brought up, where is Sonny? Is he still here? Where is Sonny? You brought up why there's a change. Yeah, there's a change from mind and strength. Perhaps it's because the whole focus is on the internal with the supposition that the external follows, Diba, perhaps. But it is so interesting that this is, these are all internal. Perhaps Jesus is saying something. This internal is more fundamental than the external. But it doesn't disregard the external. It's not like, okay, just don't be angry, but you can murder. <laughs> right? It's, it, it's both. Because the supposition is that if you are pure internally, what comes from the heart. Jesus just said that in Matthew 15. What comes from the heart proceeds from the mouth. So if it's good, good is going to come out. If it's evil, evil is going to come out. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. On all these two commandments depend all the laws and the prophets. 
Sonny, are we still commanded to love the Lord your God and to love our neighbor as ourselves? Do we still need to obey these commands? Yes, of course. Of course. So this is why, in, in one sense, I think a lot of people just, we're talking past each other. We're talking past each other. But the rub, the rub, the rub is that these two commandments, these two commandments, they summarize the law and the prophets. So for sure, specific application for the sacrifices, maybe there's fulfillment. Maybe the feast days have some feast days have passed away. But is the law and the prophets still in effect today in some way? We have to say yes. Otherwise, we we have a different law. We are no longer required to love God or love others. It's just, it's impossible. We can't get around this. So we cannot say the law or the prophets are abrogated. We cannot say that. Things are accomplished. Things are brought to its full meaning. Jesus, of course, does them perfectly and gives us his righteousness. And it's also a way for us to live. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Here we go. This is going to get to the heart here. We're, we're, we're almost done. We got two more passages. We've got two more passages. Um, next, we're going to go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Everyone go there. You need to go there. Matthew chapter 23. This is the seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. So this is coming to a climax in which Jesus is going to just say the Pharisees, they, the kingdom is taken from them and given to the another that will produce fruits. So Jesus gives the seven woes. We talked about the woes in uh, redefining leadership, the shepherds of Ezekiel 34. No hope. When you get the woes, sigh out. You're out. The woes, the prophetic woes are already past. You are experiencing the suffering of judgment. I, we can't read all of these things. But look at, look at these woes. So, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces because you will not enter it and you will not allow others to enter it. Look at this. This is directly in relationship to Matthew chapter 5. Look at this. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, anyone who swears by the temple, it is nothing. <laughs> but anyone who swears by the gold is bound by his oath. Literally a correction from Matthew 5. What is it? Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Everyone see that? Literally, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple which has made the, the gold holy? You say if anyone swears on the altar, no problem. It is nothing. But if anyone swears on the gift of the altar, he's bound by his oath. So what they were saying here, literally. They were saying, if you made the swear, just swear on the altar. You didn't have to do it. <laughs> that was the tradition. But if you, if you swear on the sacrifice, you better keep it. God's going to judge you. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The whole intention of the Old Testament, the old law was just yes and yes, no and no. Which is greater, the gift or the gift or the altar? The altar that makes the gift sacred. So whoever swears by it, the altar swears by it and everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by it and everything on it. Whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. So what he was saying was, you were commanded actually not to swear using God's name. Diba? That was the command. Don't swear by heaven because it's God is there. His throne is there, and he is there who sits on it. This is where we get to the root of the law, and where we would say the law has the eternal components and is not abrogated. Do not say that. For you tithe on mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Munga kapatid. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You ought to have done 
these without neglecting the other. Weightier matters. <laughs> Some people would say the law is done away with. Are the weightier matters of the law done away with? It cannot be. It cannot be. You blind guide straining at the gnat, you swallow the camel. <laughs> so you're worried about the fly. You're worried about the little fly in your, in your cup and you're swallowing a camel. It's like, you're worried about the gnat, but you're swallowing an asshole, right? A dog. It's like, oh, it's like, what are you smoking? <laughs> Look at this. You clean the outside of the cup, but inside you are full of greed and indulgence. The internal, the law was focused on the internal as well. Whitewashed tombs. Look at this. This comes back to the righteousness we're talking about. Bada bing, bada boom. I close my case. You outwardly appear to be righteous. <laughs> outwardly. But inwardly, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Lawlessness is the lawlessness is living without law. This is the this is the opposite of righteousness. So unless your righteousness exceeds that of unlawlessness, <laughs> unless you're right, unless you exceed the lawlessness and full of hypocrisy of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he's saying. Because it was purely external. There was nothing internal. Nothing. So this is not a this is not an issue of you got to get it perfect or you're no this is an issue of a different kind of righteousness my disciples will not live like this everyone repented of their sin the disciples came out to john everyone was being baptized everyone was saying, i confess i want to follow the messiah but they were living like the devil they were living like the devil and jesus is saying you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness, and my disciples will not live like that. I'm already like, I'm like a pastor now. I'm not even teaching. I'm preaching. I'm sorry. Last passage, and we'll be done with Matthew. Maybe we can reflect on this. I'm just going to read this and highlight. If ever the dispensationalist says the teachings of Jesus were on hold because the kingdom has been put on pause, we are not in the kingdom of heaven that's on hold for the millennial kingdom. We're not under the Sermon on the Mount. In fairness, many dispensationalists now, they've come back on that. That was more older. In fairness, many dispensationalists will say, no, we, the Sermon on the Mount is for us, so I want to be fair. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. They saw and worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Chalmer, this is for you, brother. This is for you, brother. Make disciples by baptizing them. It, it implies repentance and faith, for sure. In the name of the Father, the Son. So this, we could say here, could be uh, conversion. And... I mean, I'm not being technical here. I'm just kind of being like big picture here. Holy living, Christian living, Christian living, my brothers. Look at this, teaching them, teaching them. The one who does and teaches will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Teaching them to observe. Now observe, that's a word that is susceptible to abuse. Teaching them, the, the word should be, the word should be obey. That's the sense there. That's the Greek word. Observe is, it means the same thing, but someone could, someone could, someone could play some more pharisa pharisaical tricks. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus highlighted that the, the law could be summarized, love God and love others. The internal to the external, teaching them 
to obey all that I have commanded you. So are we under the Mosaic covenant? Absolutely not. We're under the new covenant of the blood of Jesus. Are we under the law? We are, we are under the true intent of the law. The true intent of the law is no different than what we are under. There is only specific application that maybe has been brought to fulfillment in Christ's work of sacrifice or fulfilled historically redemptively, but the, the, the fundamental components of the law that we can summarize, love God, love others, is still in effect. It has not been abrogated. It has not been abrogated. We are to teach others as I have commanded you. What time is it? Oh my goodness, say 30. Um, so <clears throat> um, let's take a break and we're gonna try to rush through these other passages. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. It should be fast. Let's do a break. Let's, let's do a break. Let's take a 10 minute break and let's do a breakout session where you, where you, I'm going to be very clear here. The, the law, what Chalmers says is true. In the passages that we're looking at, the law is also designed to drive us to Christ. We'll, the law can be used to drive us to Christ, but the law is also in the life of the believer. So what I want us to do is I want us to look at the passages. I'm going to give some passages when we come back from the break. And I want, I want you to say, is this in the context of the life of the believer or is this in the context of driving people to Christ? Okay. Anyone, everyone good on that? Everyone good on that? Okay. Let's take a, a, a 10 minute break. Uh, let's do six minute break. Okay. So, okay. We need to start. I'm sorry to cut the conversation short. Um, so what we're going to do is we will work for, for, 19 minutes. We'll go a little bit over just because we started late. We started 11 minutes late. So I'm going to reclaim my 11 minutes at the end. And so what we'll do is I'm splitting you into three groups. The passages that we still have, let's, let's go, let's go back to my screen share here. Let's go back here. Screen share. So what I want to do is you have your assignment Everyone should have completed it. Maybe some of you have not. So you still need to complete, do the questions that, that, that or, were assigned there. But let's look at these passages here in your group. Romans 2, Luke 18, Romans 13, James 2, Ephesians 6, and Ephesians 2. Uh, ignore Ephesians 2 because that's, that's, that's something else. Maybe we'll get to that next week. But what I want us to look at here in Romans, Luke, uh, the two Romans loop. We want to ask the question. So we had the questions from your assignment, but I want to specifically ask, what's the context? Is it primarily in a gospel context, driving us to Christ? Or is it in the life, is the law being applied in the life of the believer? Is it, um, um, and look for key words. We looked at a word, fulfill, look at the different range of meaning. How is fulfill being used? Perhaps it, you will see and better understand this word fulfill when you actually look at these passages. So um, uh, uh, let's look at these passages here. Uh, Romans 2, Luke 18, Romans 13, James 2, and Ephesians 6. So you have three groups. Try to get to all of them. You should be very familiar. You should be very familiar with these passages because you already done this, did the assignment. Um, so let's go ahead and let's, I'll open the rooms. Any questions or comments? Everyone understands what I'm asking of you here? Okay, it should be self-explanatory. We're just looking at, we're, we're really applying what we learn in Matthew in these other contexts. So, okay, so we're just going to go through here, talk through this quickly. It's late, but I hope, I hope we're learning. Romans chapter 2, verses, uh, we could say 12 to 16. What is the... From our study today, discussion, what is the primary context of this passage being used? For what? Oh, uh, Pastor Tim, we discussed the speaker, the audience, the command, and if it is still binding or... Okay, th th so so we did that last week, but we'll do it again. So, so th the speaker is... Paul. Go ahead, Kay. Paul. The, the speaker is Paul. Paul. Okay. Yes, uh, the audience, uh, the Jews. Well, from last week, Diba, it was the church, the church in Rome. It would include Jew and Christian Jews and Gentiles, Diba. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. So church in Rome. Okay. And then there's no command. It's it's the it's and, the law, diba? Yes, it's the talks about the law in now, now let's. Ask, I'm going to ask you a question, Kaya. I hope that you can be strong, or someone can help her. But I think you can do it. Diba. So there, there is the law with the Jews and the Gentiles. Does everyone? Do you see how that it applies to both now? If we're dealing with that internal component. Yes. So it's then, is it? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's that in. You can speak of. The Gentiles having the law, even though they don't have the law, <laughs> because of that internal, it's the same. The internal component is the same. So, Kaya, what was your conclusion? Binding or not binding? It is still binding. Still yes, binding? it is. It is still binding. Now, last question: the context. What in in this context? What is it? Is it being used in the life of the church or is it being used? How is it being used? Pre or post conversion, Kaya? Pre or post conversion? Is, is Romans 2 before or after salvation by faith is introduced? We, Romans should be our primary. Maybe we'll do a book study on Romans. Romans 2, is that, is that does Roman two, Romans 2 describe the believer or is that pre conversion? Anyone? Pre. Free, free, this is free, free. free. This yeah, is so for those, yes, for the unbelievers, which is both Jews and Gentiles. So the context, is it used in the life of the Christian or is it to be used to what? From what Chalmer was saying? Is, unbelievers. And non-believers, yes. Drive when you to are Christ. Bring to Christ. Gospel context. Is that what you're going to say, Kaya? Yes, yes. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Please forgive me. That was very rude. I, I'm really sorry. Sorry. That was bad. Um, it's okay, Pastor. Yeah, so this context, the primary purpose of the law is to show that we all fall short, Diba, in chapter 3. So, so, so for this context, the law is being used primarily to show the need for Christ, to show the need of our failure, okay? Um, Next passage, let's look at Luke, Luke 18. What's Pastor the other Inting. part? Pastor Inting, that's Pastor Inting. That's our group. Go ahead. Drive oh, I think to you're Christ. Muted. Pastor, I Drive think you're muted. Christ. Bring to Christ. The conclusion think... is bring to Christ, the ruler. Yeah. Inting, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so the... the, the ruler came to Jesus and this concern is about eternal life. Yeah. And uh, Jesus brought in the law mm -hmm. to which uh, the ruler um, claimed that he had perfected. And uh, Jesus, so th this is where we were uh, spent time talking. Uh, Jesus said, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And we said that Jesus was testing the ruler if he truly loved God or his treasure. And especially this is the book of Luke. Uh, the book of Luke is teaching that if we really know God, if we really have that relationship with God, uh, then our relationship with earthly things should change. So it, it, it came out that this man... Uh, do not really love God with all his heart, the first two commandments. And, uh, but Jesus said this is possible with God uh, when we get to verse 27. So, um, yeah, while, while this surely would <clears throat> tell us that it's, this tells us that, that loving God with more than anything else in the world, which is basically, what's the commandment is, is possible. And so if that happens, then we get to obey him uh, truly. So no, it's that's, binding. Yeah, that's, and it's, yeah, and it's, so, no, so, so it's still, it's still in existence, Diba. So in order for us to drive people to Christ, the law has to be in existence. Does everyone see that? If the law is no longer binding, 
we can't get them to Christ. You see what I'm saying? So, so it's still binding, but this context here is primarily to drive them to Christ. Okay, everyone sees that? So it's not an either or, it's a both and, but each context is accenting something different. Okay, it's accenting something different. Excellent job. Uh, just want to highlight all of the commands that Jesus first gives. It's found in the Decalogue. Bibahi goes through, and then he 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 addresses the the loving God part when he says he's he's kept all of these things. And so, anyway, um, great, excellent, excellent job. Okay, so um, uh, let's go on now to um, let's look at Romans thirteen. Romans 13 verses 8 to, uh, is it 8 to 10 or it's there's maybe it's more than 8 to 10 it's 8 to 14 yes 8, 8 to 14 8, 8, 8 to 14 okay so uh what is the context of Romans 8 uh 13 8 to 14 it's the the context is uh it's gospel it's drive to Christ gospel context okay so question for us first uh Henry is okay. It before is it is it being addressed to? Uh, this is I think uh, I think this is addressed to believers. Yeah. So excellent, excellent. So it's believers, and so therefore. Yeah, it's in thirteen verse one. Yeah. Uh, it's subject. Uh, it's addressed to the believers. So this is Christian life. Christian life. Uh huh. So it's a guide. It's a guide. Uh, it's a guide for the Christian. Um, what laws are present in here? Henry. Six, seven, eight. So the Decalogue is present, Diba. Decalogue. Yeah. And the focus is on loving others, right? Mm -hmm. and That's what is the second the... half of the Decalogue. Yes, yes. And so what is the word that's being used? What is the word that's being used? That is love. a word from our context. It's love. It's love. Yes, but what is the other word that is the hot the hot button word? Not only love, but uh, what is that word? The, the it's F, obedience. F, yeah, but the F word, the F word there. It's a good word, not a bad word. The F word. Fulfilled. 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 And, if we're, and if we're to define fulfill, it's not complete. It's not fill up. It's diba. It's do. The one who loves. Fulfills the law. He does the law. Do you see that? So anyone who only sees fulfill as coming and accomplishing misses the law. The, the word is much broader than that. And in this context, 100% it's due. Is it still binding, Manga Kapatid? Yeah. Binding. Binding. So... I really hope that we're seeing that the law is still in effect. It's still ongoing. It's binding in the life of the believer. It drives the unbeliever to Christ. Um, James. James 2, Ooh, eight, eight, to, 8 to 14. What's the context? Group 3. Bring to Christ again. So is it, well, the context first, is it, is it, is it, in the context of unbelievers or believers, Koya Boy? Maybe it's a believer. believer. Okay, I see. Okay, so we could say it's debated. Fair enough. So we could do at least both, Diba, because James is, is writing to believers, but there could also be an unbeliever sense. So fair enough. So let's do let's do both. Let's have both here. That, that's a fair statement. Everyone sees how it could be both. It could be both contexts, believer and unbeliever. Uh, because the context is for a believer, but there's also this, if you commit one sin. So it's also showing that it's it's also convicting of sin. So fair enough. Um, uh, what what type of law is in view here? What type of law is in view here? What do you Decalogue. see? Decalogue. Decalogue. Ah. Is it still binding? Binding. Yeah. All right, last one. Romans. Romans. Ah, not Romans. Ephesians. Ephesians. Six, one to four. 
What is this context? It's for the believers. Christian life. It's, yes, excellent. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, and it's the fifth commandment. So still Decalogue. And it's uh, for children to parents, but there's also a commandment for parents to children. <laughs> But that's the intent, Diva. That it, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Yes. Binding, Diva. Yes. So I hope, I hope from this, I hope from this lesson, this is biblical theology. You saw it first on biblical theology. That that if you notice the law as a Mosaic covenant has a specific application, it's a different context now. We're in the life of the church. We're in the new covenant. But, but the fundamental truth of the Decalogue, of the law, is not abrogated. It's not gone. It's still in effect. And I want to leave you with the last thought here. I want to leave you with the last thought here, okay? If... The law of God is not the same as the law of Christ. And we're talking about those eternal truths. If it's a different law, fundamentally, we're not talking about peripherals or details or the, the whole system. No one disagrees with that. But if we do not see them fundamentally as being the same, there is an issue in the Trinity. Does everyone see that? Because this is the Son. This is the Father. The eternal law is the eternal law. Fundamentally, it's the same. So if we claim there's, there's fundamentally a difference in Christ's law compared to the law of God, those eternal components, then we have a major issue. So what we want to say is no. We want to say this is the same. Okay. Let's close in prayer. We went over time, but I hope that th this is, if nothing else was learned from this class, I really hope that this really brings in context. The third use of the law is to be used in civil contexts. We don't have time to discuss that. This is not a class on the law. This is to emphasize that the law should drive, we should use this in gospel contexts. And this is the law that we should follow, that the, the Christian should follow. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your blessing and your guidance. Father God, thank you for giving us your law. Um, help us to see those weightier matters, faithfulness, love, and justice. Father God, may we have an internal fixation upon your command. And allow that to come out uh, externally, Father. We, wanna, we want to make disciples of all nations. We want to baptize them in the, name, in the name of you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit. And Father God, give us the strength and the, and the uh, fortitude to teach them to obey everything that you've commanded us. And we thank you so much that your Son is with us, even to the end of this age. He is inside us through your Holy Spirit. Father God, I ask a blessing upon these students. May we finish this semester strong. May we see these relationships and may we teach our, 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 uh, our members. May we use this in our personal life. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.